ஸோ எல்லாருக்கும் தமிழ்நாடு அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தின் சார்பாக எனது இனிய மாலை வாழ்த்துக்களை தெரிவித்துக் கொள்கிறேன் தமிழ்நாடு அறிவியல் இயக்கம் ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி எண்பதிலிருந்து செயல்பட்டு வருகிறது அதனுடைய அடிப்படை உறுப்பினர் அதன் துவக்க உறுப்பினர் டாக்டர் டிஆர்ஜி எண்பதிலிருந்தே அவர் பிஹெச்டி பண்ணும்போது அந்த இயக்கத்தை துவக்கணும் அந்த இயக்கம் என்று சென்னையில் மட்டும் செயல்பட்டு கொண்டிருந்தது இன்றைக்கு தமிழகம் முழுவதும் அது செயல்படக்கூடிய ஒரு அமைப்பாக மாறி இருக்கிறது இருபதாயிரத்துக்கு அதிகமான உறுப்பினர்கள் அதில் குறிப்பாக மாணவர்கள் ஆசிரியர்களை கொண்ட ஒரு இயக்கமாக இருக்கிறது இந்த இயக்கம் பல்வேறு பணிகளை செய்து வருகிறது முதலாவது பணியாக அது ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி எண்பதுகளில் நடைபெற்ற அறிவொளி இயக்கம் ஃபங்க்ஷனல் லிட்ரஸி அதை வந்து சிறப்பாக தமிழகம் முழுவதும் முதல்ல விருதுநகர் மாவட்டத்தில் துவங்கினாங்க அப்புறம் புதுக்கோட்டை மாவட்டம் காஞ்சிபுரம் திருவள்ளூர் ஒன்றுபட்ட காஞ்சிபுரம் மாவட்டம் இதிலெல்லாம் அறிவொளி இயக்கத்தில் அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தினுடைய உறுப்பினர்கள் ஆர்வமாக செயல்பட்டு வந்தார்கள் அதை தாண்டி குழந்தைகளுக்கான சிறப்பான புற ஒரு ஒரு நிகழ்வுகள் நாங்கள் வைத்திருக்கிறோம் அது வந்து குழ சில்ட்ரன்ஸ் சயின்ஸ் காங்கிரஸ் குழந்தைகள் அறிவியல் மாநாடு ஒவ்வொரு மாவட்டத்திலையும் பள்ளி குழந்தைகளுக்கு ஆய்வு மனப்பான்மையை வளர்ப்பதற்காக அவர்களிடம் அந்த பள்ளியிலிருந்தே ஒரு ஆசிரியை தெரி ஆசிரியரை தெரிவு செய்து அவரை கைடாக நியமித்து அவர்களுடைய வழிகாட்டுதலின் அடிப்படையில் ப்ராஜெக்டை செய்வாங்க மாவட்டத்தில் வந்து அவங்க ஒரு ப்ரெசன்டேஷன் கொடுப்பாங்க எல்லா ப்ராஜெக்டும் வரும் அதில் ஒரு மூன்று சிறந்த ப்ராஜெக்டை தெரிவு செய்து மா மாநில அளவுக்கு போகும் மாநில அளவுலேயும் மாநில அறிவியல் மாநாடு நடக்கும் அதுலேயும் மிக சிறந்த மூன்றை தேர்ந்தெடுத்து அகில இந்திய அளவில் போகும் ஸோ இந்த இதை வந்து கிட்டத்தட்ட ஒரு ஆறு மாதம் இந்த பணிகள் வந்து தமிழ்நாடு அறிவியல் இயக்கம் எல்லா பள்ளிகளிலையும் போய் செய்து கொண்டிருக்கிறோம் அதை தாண்டி தமிழ்நாடு அறிவியல் இயக்கம் பத்திரிகைகள் அறிவியல் மாத எழுதல் நடத்துது துளிர் என்ற அறிவியல் மாத எழுதல் ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி எண்பத்தி ஏழிலிருந்து நடந்து வருகிறது கிட்டத்தட்ட முப்பத்தோரு ஆண்டுகளை கடந்து மிகச்சிறப்பாக செயல்பட்டு வரும் சிறுவர்களுக்கான அறிவியல் மாத இதழ் தொழில் அது பல்வேறு பரிசுகளை உலக அளவில் வாங்கியிருக்கு அந்த அந்த மாத எழுதல் அது அது தமிழில் வருது அதே போல் ஆங்கிலத்துலேயும் ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி எண்பத்தொம்பதிலிருந்து ஜந்தர் மந்தர் என்ற இதழ் வருகிறது அதுவும் சிறுவர்களுக்கும் பள்ளி கல்லூரி மாணவர்களுக்குமான மாத இதழ் அறி விஞ்ஞான அறிவியல் மாத இதழ் ச இதை தாண்டி நாங்கள் அறிவியல் கலை பிரச்சார ப கலை வடிவத்தில் அறிவியல் பிரச்சார பயணம் நாங்கள் பல்வேறு இடங்களில் மேற்கொள்ளுகிறோம் ஸோ அதுக்காக ட்ரே ஒரு நாடக வடிவத்திலையும் அறிவியல் கருத்துக்களை எடுத்து செல்வதை செய்து கொண்டிருக்கிறோம் இப்போ அதனுடைய அடுத்த கட்டமாக வெறும் சிறுவர்கள் சாதாரண மக்கள் மட்டும் இல்லாமல் ஒரு உயர் அறிவியலை பேசுவதற்கான ஒரு ஏற்பாடாக தான் நாங்கள் இந்த நிகழ்ச்சியை துவங்கி இருக்கிறோம் அதில் டாக்டர் டிஆர்ஜி மிக அருமையாக சொன்னார் இது நாலாவது நிகழ்ச்சி மூன்று நிகழ்ச்சிகள் நாங்கள் வெற்றிகரமாக நடத்தியிருக்கிறோம் எல்லாத்துலேயும் வைடு பார்ட்டிசிபேஷன் எல்லா கல்லூரிகளிலிருந்து வந்து மாணவர்கள் வந்து கலந்து கொண்டிருக்கிறார்கள் எல்லா அதில் நாங்கள் பேசப்பட்ட விஷயங்கள் மிக எளிமையாக மிக எளிமையாக ஸ்டீஃபன் ஆக்கின்ஸ் காஸ்மாலஜியை பற்றியும் அவருடைய கான்ட்ரிபியூஷன் பற்றியும் பிளாக் ஹோலை பற்றியும் மிக எளிமையான விஷயத்தில் சாதாரண மக்களுக்கு புரிகிற மாதிரியும் பள்ளிக்கூட அதுவும் கல்லூரியில் படிப்பவர்களுக்கு மேற்கொண்டு தங்களுடைய படிப்பை கொண்டு செல்வதற்கு இது உதவிகரமாக அவங்களை வழிகாட்டுவதற்கு ஆர்வத்தை தூண்டும் விதத்திலும் நாங்கள் வந்து இந்த நிகழ்ச்சிகளை நடத்தி வருகிறோம் இரண்டாவது நிகழ்ச்சியாக நியூட்ரினோ மூன்றாவது நோபல் ப்ரைஸ் இப்போ நாலாவது நோபல் ப்ரைஸில் விடுபட்டு போன ஃபிசிக்ஸை பற்றி இன்றைக்கு பேச இருக்கிறோம் இது இதை தான் இது இது தொடரும் எங்களுக்கு நாங்கள் மீண்டும் பல்வேறு ஏர் தலைப்புகளிலே எங்கள் பேசுவதற்கு நாங்கள் தொடர்ந்து முயற்சி எடுத்து கொண்டிருக்கிறோம் குறைந்தபட்சம் இரண்டு மாதத்திற்கு ஒரு முறையாவது இந்த மாதிரியான கூட்டங்கள் தமிழ்நாடு அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தில் சார்பாக நடைபெறும் நாங்கள் அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தின் சார்பாக உங்களிடம் வைக்கும் வேண்டுகோள் என்னவென்றால் நீங்கள் அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தில் உறுப்பினராகுங்கள் நாங்கள் சென்னையிலேயே ஒரு அறிவியல் வெகுஜன அறிவியல் சொற்பொழிவு தொடர் என்ற ஒரு கிளை இயங்கி வருகிறது ஒரு அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தினுடைய ஒரு பிரான்ச்சாக ஒரு சாப்டராக அது இயங்கி வருகிறது அந்த கிளையில் நீங்கள் உறுப்பினராகுங்க முப்பது ரூபாய் ஆண்டு சந்தா உங்களுக்கு விஞ்ஞான சரகு என்ற மேகசின் வந்து ஒரு நியூஸ் லெட்டர் வந்து உங்கள் வீட்டு முகவரிக்கு வரும் அதோடு சேர்த்து இந்த ப்ரோக்ராமெல்லாம் தொடர்ந்து நடத்துவதற்கு நீங்களும் பங்கெடுப்பாளர்களாக ஆர்வலர்களாக உள்ள வந்து ஆர்கனைசராக மாறணுங்கிறதையும் நாங்கள் இந்த சார்பாக உங்கள் சார்பாக நாங்கள் நான் அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தில் சார்பாக கேட்டுக்கொள்ள விரும்புகிறேன் இப்பொழுது இந்த நிகழ்ச்சி இன்றைக்கு நடைபெறக்கூடிய நிகழ்ச்சி இரண்டு அமர்வுகளை கொண்டது முதல் அமர்வு நோபல் ப்ரைஸ் 
ஃபிசிக்ஸ் பற்றி இரண்டாயிரத்தி பதினெட்டாம் ஆண்டு வந்த ஃபிசிக்ஸ் நோபல் ப்ரைஸை பற்றி இரண்டு அறிஞர்கள் பேசி வருகிறார்கள் அதில் முதல் அறிஞர் டாக்டர் சிவராமகிருஷ்ணன் டாக்டர் பாசுதேவ் ஆச ஆச்சாரியா பாசுதேவ் ராய் இரண்டாவது அறிஞர் டாக்டர் சிவராமகிருஷ்ணன் இருவரும் வந்து இன்றைக்கு இரண்டு ரெண்டு நோபல் ப்ரைஸ் வந்திருக்கு அவங்க பேசுகிறாங்க அடுத்தது அது அந்த அமர்வுக்கு தலைமை தாங்குவதற்கு நம்மளுடைய வந்திருப்பவர் டாக்டர் பிரஃபல்லகுமார் பெஹ்ரா மிகச்சிறந்த விஞ்ஞானி அவர் வந்து சிஇஆர்என்ல பணியாற்றியிருக்கிறார் அட்லஸ்ங்கிற ப்ரா ப்ராஜெக்டில் பணியாற்றியிருக்கிறார் யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஆஃப் பென்சில்வேனியாவிலே சிறிது காலம் பணியாற்றி இப்போ சென்னை ஐஐடியில் இருக்கிறார் அவர் இந்த அமர்வுக்கு தலைமை தாங்கி நடத்தி கொடுப்பார் இதுக்கு ரெண்டாவது அமர்வு கிளைமேட் சேஞ்சை பற்றி இப்போ சமீபத்தில் நடைபெற்ற இந்த ஐபிசிசி இன்டர் கவர்மெண்ட் பேனல் ஃபார் கிளைமேட் சேஞ்ச் இந்த அமைப்பு துவங்கி முப்பது ஆண்டுகள் நிறைவேற்ற நிறைவு பெற்ற நிலையில் அது ஒரு நாற்பத்தி ஒன்பதாவது அமர்வை நடத்தியது கொரியாவிலே அந்த அமர்விலே இந்திய இந்தியாவின் சார்பாக கலந்து கொண்ட விஞ்ஞானி ஜெயராமன் இங்கே வந்து வரு வருவார் அவர் அவருடைய நிகழ்ச்சி இரண்டாவது அமர்வாக இருக்கும் அந்த நிகழ்ச்சிக்கு டாக்டர் டி ஆர் கோவிந்தராஜன் அவர்கள் தலைமை தாங்குவார்கள் இப்பொழுது இந்த நிகழ்ச்சியை துவக்கி வைப்பதில் பெருமை கொள்கிறேன் இந்த நிகழ்ச்சிக்கு வந்திருந்த உங்கள் அனைவரையும் தமிழ்நாடு அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தின் சார்பாக வருக வருக என்று வரவேற்கிறேன் மே ரிக்வஸ்ட் டாக்டர் பிரஃபல்லகுமார் பெஹ்தா பெஹ்ரா டு டேக் த சேர் ப்ளீஸ் ஹலோ குட் ஆஃப்டர்நூன் டு எவ்ரிபடி ஸோ ஐ வுட் லைக் டு தேங்க் டிஎன்சி ஃபோரம் ஃபார் ஆர்கனைசிங் திஸ் கைண்ட் ஆஃப் works of kind of thing it's a very good uh, opportunity i i have been involved in this kind of uh, uh, talks in iit madras also i have seen that there is a, a more uh, awareness about science which is very important to connect uh, the student in the college to the uh, upper forum like what is happening and they should know what is their future i think it's a very good uh, Uh, work by the uh, forum and uh, they have been doing a tremendous job well organized i have seen they you know they do it very professionally with very minimum number of people they manage and uh, very coordinated effort and they manage very nicely and uh, without taking too much time i would like to tell that uh, this is a very nice opportunity for me though it is not my field of research but uh, my colleague uh professor sivaram krishnan and uh, professor basudev roy who have been involved in this field of research and this year uh, nobel prize was given and it's a, it's a great pleasure to hear from people who are involved in the work which is being carried out in iit madras or in this uh, part of the india and uh, to get the first hand experience also so before i move i would like to invite uh, professor basudev roy to start the his presentation So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, give a talk here. I thank the Tamil Nadu Science Forum uh, profusely for bringing me here and uh, allowing me to speak and so as to give you some flavor of what the optical tweezers community is all about. I come as a representative of the community itself. So essentially uh, this year's uh, Nobel Prize was given to these three gentlemen here. yeah these three uh, people here uh, well this is not a gentleman uh, uh, arthur ashkin uh, gerard muru and donna strickland and uh, well they are basically pioneers in the fields of lasers for uh, about muru and strickland uh, siva is going to talk about i will be focusing on arthur ashkin so essentially this is a uh, uh, 
brief overview of optical tweezers, uh, talking about Arthur Ashkin's main work. So I am affiliated with the IIT Madras, of course, and uh, this is the name of my lab. And so coming to the first uh, few things that he, Arthur Ashkin did, so this is one of the early papers in 1970. So here, what he was trying to do actually was like, uh, he was trying to put in two different laser beams from two different sides and then basically form a uh, stable trap at the middle. And while he was doing that, he found something very interesting. So he, f he saw that uh, if you put in one single laser beam and you put a particle there, you will sort of see it, see the particle come in from the radial direction and in the la lateral direction, it will just push up. So it's coming in and going up. So somewhat like this. So if you put a particle like this, the light comes in, it pulls in from this side, and it pushes in this direction. So he was using, he, he saw this effect, and then he put in two different laser beams from two different sides, and he managed to get a stable trap here. So that was one of the first observations of a, of a laser trap. Basically, you can hold in space a particle using laser beams without, without any contact effect. So that was the first thing that he saw. Later on, he developed it uh, extensively. He used it to actually develop this kind of a three-dimensional trap. You do not actually have just two-dimensional confinement. You have a third-dimensional confinement in addition as well. So what, so what it looks like is that uh, so if you have uh, this kind of a focused laser beam, so essentially a, a laser beam is like a Gaussian profile. So it has basically uh, a, a Gaussian profile with the edges having a lower intensity while the central region has a higher intensity. So if you focus it down, you get a very high intense spot and on this side it tails down, on this side it tails down, on this side it tails down, on the other side it tails down. So you can sort of show that they, it's here there is an equilibrium spot at which the particle will be trapped. In, uh, in both the lateral and the transverse directions it will be trapped. So th this is what he showed in his famous paper in 1998, uh, 1980, uh, 1986. So it is uh, in collaboration with Stephen Chu, who is another of the Nobel laureates uh, for a different reason. But uh, he, Arthur Ashkin is the first author of this paper. What is the size of the particles? The size of the particles, I'll get into that. You can go from, this is possibly 10 microns. And I'll talk about more details. I'll give you more details, like you can go all the way to 10 nanometers in size. No, not yet that. Molecules, uh, so I can tell you that already atoms can be trapped. Neutral atoms can be trapped. You, if you look at the work of uh, uh, what's, uh, somebody in MIT, uh, so he, he had been trapping these neutral atoms, neutral Rydberg atoms to do quantum computation. He, he formed a gate out of that, a, a 50, 51 chain of neutral atoms. And he has been in, uh, using these interactions between Rydberg atoms to do some co computing basically. But you can do that. So that's an atom level, but there's nothing in the middle. So atom is there, but then again, there's nothing in the middle till five nanometers, and there again, dielectric particles or nanoparticles or gold nanoparticles or something of the sort appears. But there's nothing in the middle at the moment. So this is the kind of the effect that I had been telling you about. So in the transverse direction, what happens is there is a less light here, and there's more light in the middle. So if you put a particle here, much less light is scattered in this direction by the dielectric particle and more light is scattered from this direction towards this side. Therefore, by conservation of momentum, linear momentum, you get a recoil kick from this side towards the center and that gives it the force to trap the particle. So that's uh, the main idea of this thing and the same sort of thing happens in the, even in this transverse, uh, in this lateral direction as well and you form a three-dimensional trap here. So it almost effect acts. So if you take a, gr a gradient of the intensity, this is the trap you, this is the potential you will get basically, the force you will get out of this thing. So the uh, potential looks like a Gaussian and you take the gradient of that and that gives you the three dimensional potential well that I'm talking about. So that's the sort of thing. Now here you have, uh, you can sort of describe the same thing, just the bottom part of the well, instead of calling it a Gaussian, you call it simple harmonic. So you call it k times x, basically with a spring connected. So you have all the three dimensions here and all the three dimensions are trapped in, in this kind of a potential. So you sort of in, uh, during, during the theory, uh, they actually describe it in this, uh, in this minima of the potential well and they call it uh, 
the spring constant, basically. So I'll get into those details later. So just to briefly give you one more aspect. So how do you detect this uh, sort of light? So it sort of comes in here, and the particle is displaced on this side. It, because of the displacement, the laser light is actually scattered. The forward scattered light is displaced in this direction. One direction it is displaced. So you can actually use a nice trick to actually detect these things. So how do you detect it? You put it in a four, uh, quadrants, four quadrants photodiode, a split photodiode. So you have four quadrants in there, A, B, C, and D, just like oriented uh, like this. So and the top half minus the bottom half gives you information about the Y. The right half minus the left half gives you information about the X. And the total intensity over all the four quadrants gives you information about the Z position of this thing. So that's the sort of uh, detection system we use. This actually the uh, motivation for this comes from atomic force microscopy community. So they, uh, this is the sa same sort of thing they have used and this is successfully working all over. So now what is, what are we looking at basically? So we have a particle which is suspended in water medium. What was Arthur Askin looking at? So we have, we have a particle suspended in water medium and uh, it is in uh, water molecules are moving all over the place, jigging, jigging uh, all over the place. And if you put a particle there, it is continuously going to make a zigzag motion and diffuse around inside the water medium. It's called Brownian motion. So what is Brownian motion? Essentially, if you take the time series of the position, it is going to have all kinds of frequencies in there. So if, if, it, it'll just be diffusing around. So if you take the position probability distribution, initially it is going to be a Gaussian with the center around this and as a function of time, it will just diffuse around. It will just be larger and larger. So that's Brownian motion for you. So the, uh, the other feature of this Brownian motion is that you will have all the frequencies equally present in that. So if you take the Fourier transform, if you, are, if you know the concept of Fourier transform as in decomposing this time series into the fre different frequencies. So if you have a sine wave, for example, it's one single, uh, one single frequency. So you decompose this time series into many different frequencies and you will find that for this Brownian motion, the time series of the Brownian motion, you will get uh, the, a constant power spectrum. As in this Fourier domain, the uh, spectrum looks like a flat line. So that's called white noise. So this is the kind of thing that we are trying to trap. So this is, I, I developed the background for it because we are going to look right now into the power spectrum uh, of this sort of particle. So the very next thing that I come down to is how does the power spectrum look like in a trap? So as I said, so this is the kind of equation for it. It basically comes down from a simple harmonic oscillator equation, mx double dot plus gamma x dot plus kx equal to some uh, drive term. So the drive term can be a Gaussian varying random noise because of this Brownian motion that I just told you. It's uh, centered around zero, but there is a distribution to it. And so the mass term happens to be five orders of magnitude smaller than this uh, uh, drag term. So we just normally neglect it. So the equation simplifies to gamma x dot plus kx equal to some Gaussian varying random noise term. So if you take the Fourier transform of this thing, it should, in principle, for the normal Gaussian mo uh, Brownian motion, it should be completely flat. But if you use a trap, this thing gets clipped here. It gets clipped here and it rolls off at well, this is omega squared, omega to the power minus two, it, it rolls off. Here, it is completely flat. So in this region, this is the x, this is the y, and this is the z. So you can see that this, motion, this position where the trap stops responding is, the, is indicated by this trap stiffness. So this is the indication of the trap stiffness, and the amplitude of this thing <coughs> come, is directly related to the uh, Diffusion, the, the amount of diffusion at room temperature, Einstein postulated a long time ago that it is uh, the diffusion, diffusion coefficient is going to be KBT over gamma. So that KBT over gamma comes in here and you can show that this is related to this. There is a sensitivity parameter, so this is how you can calibrate it. This is the diffusion coefficient is equal to KBT over beta squared gamma, beta being the voltage to nanometer conversion, if you can just ignore it and just say D is equal to KBT over gamma. So that's the sort of thing. So you have two features here. This is the corner frequency and the amplitude of this thing, this amplitude here. So using these two parameters, you can calibrate a trap, basically. You can calibrate a trap and you can find out how much the particle, based on how much the particle moved by 
from the equilibrium position, you can find out how much is the force that was applied on the particle as well. So if you, you can think about a configuration where you have, you have a kind of a flow basically happening and the particle is displaced from equilibrium. So that is the amount of force that you are applying so that the particle is displaced from equilibrium. So you can find it out from the trap stiffness basically. Trap stiffness and the sensitivity, you can find out how much is the, uh, well, the other parameter, the diffusion coefficient, the, this guy, D. And here is something else. I wanted to illustrate this thing because I'll be building upon this uh, concept later on. It's called a mean square displacement. So if you take this time series and you just take the uh, way in which the uh, signal, the uh, mean square displacement basically gives mean square displacement, the, how the Gaussian is evolving as a function of uh, time basically. So as at smaller times, how is the, uh, Dif uh, the variance around this mean, how is it evolving as a function of time? So this is a time in log scale and this is the variance around this mean position. So if you have uh, an, a kind of a pure Brownian motion, this exponent, it's it comes down to x squared is equal to 2 dt. x squared equal to 2 dt. For one dimensional motion, is x squared is 2 dt. For two dimensions, it's x squared is equal to 4 dt. And for six or three dimensions, it's x squared equal to 6 dt. So you can see that the x square, or for that matter, it will be r square in higher dimensions. So this x squared is actually proportional to time. So if you have x square here, it will be proportional to time. So this will be a straight line with an exponent uh, with a power, this power law of one. Now, if you change that, if you have something which is super diffusive, it can have exponent which is larger than one. If you have sub diffusive, it has an exponent which is lesser than one. If you have ballistic, as in, uh, if it is uh, moving in out without water, it will have an exponent of two basically because x is equal to vt, and then you have x squared equal to v squared t squared. So there will be exponent of two. So th like that. So the Brownian motion will have just exponent of one. So I come to the degrees of freedom that you can detect using the optical tweezers. So what are these uh, uh, three, uh, six time degrees of freedom that you can have in an airplane? For, uh, typically you can have the three translational motion axis, X, Y, and Z, and you can have the rotations. You can have the rotations. You can have uh, this yaw axis is like this in the X, Y plane uh, about the Z axis. The roll axis is like this, and the pitch axis is like this. But uh, in the optical tweezers, I can tell you right now that you can only do X, Y, and Z, and the yaw. This yaw axis you can do. The pitch so far has not been explored so much. We are trying to actually make some headway into it. We have in our uh, IIT Madras, we have tried to do something here. We, have, we can detect it now, but we still cannot generate it so far. So, so I show you some couple of videos of, this is not showing up very well. It's not showing up very well. Well, there are two particles here which are executing Brownian motion. Uh, well, unfortunately, the GIF video is probably too dark, I think. Uh, I can see it here. It's, uh, it's just not visible. Uh, let's see. Well, I can show you uh, here, like, on the screen itself. So if you can if you can sort of see it here, there are two particles here. Okay. This is unfortunate. It was disappointing that even this one did not show up. This is much clearer. Mm, nah. I think it will not show up. Anyway, I'll, I'll show you later on if, you, if you're interested. So it, I'll describe it to you. There, are, there is a set of two particles, one here and one here, and it's executing the Brownian motion that I just told you, but it is now held by the tweezers. So it is not able to, the mean position is the, roughly the same, but it is executing Brownian motion around it. So that's uh, so one particle is here and there is one particle here and it is sort of uh, 
So there is a kind of a separation between that and you, if you have if you have interactions amongst the particles it will be affected by the presence of these interactions if you have attractive interactions it will pull towards one side if it is repulsive interaction it will pull towards the other side so and there is an rbc a red blood cell trapped here in this kind of a space and uh, it is uh, oriented like it is a biconcave shape as in it is like a disc uh, an rbc looks like a disc it's a very uh, kind of an elastic kind of uh, cell it can flow through your capillaries and stuff, very tiny capillaries which is much smaller than your uh, RBC itself but it can sort of wiggle around and deform and you can still go through. So it is very elastic in nature. So I showed you a, a trapped RBC here which uh, unfortunately did not show up but this one shows up, yeah. So this is a kind of a, it's a trapped particle and here instead of actually not just transverse there is also rotational confinement here. So we are using a birefringent particle. So the bi particle has such properties that one direction of refractive index is higher than the other two directions. So let us say the x direction has a higher refractive index than the y and the z and so it aligns with the linear, lip if you uh, trap with linearly polarized light it aligns with this direction and it can sort of uh, if you change the axis of this rotation. Uh, axis of this polarization it can turn the particle. So you can please note that there are four lobes that are generated in the dark state and this is the bright state. It is put under cross polarizers if you uh, uh, cross polarizers as one polarization is uh, one axis of polarization is like this the other will be like this. So if you put um, kind of a, a aligned with the axis of this polarizer you will get a dark spot as in the intensity would be minimum. And if you put it uh, at 45 degrees, you will get some light propagating through. So that's what it is happening here. So this is the bright spot and the other thing is the dark spot here. So that's the sort of thing. So using this, uh, what sort of materials can we trap with this optical tweezers? So as I showed you just like a, a little while back, the, you can trap dielectric transparent particles as conceived by Arthur Raskin himself earlier. So you can trap polystyrene, you can trap silica, you can trap titania particles. Titania has some uh, other properties that it can trap, uh, the trap stiffness is much higher. So uh, you can have metal nanoparticles like gold and silver up to 5 to 10 nanometers of size. And then you can trap carbon nanotubes, you can trap quantum dots and recently together with him we are trying to actually develop some up converting nanoparticles which can sort of uh, which which you can trap and uh, if the absorption uh, matches with the trapping wavelength it fluoresces in blue or green. So in the uh, trapping light maybe let us say 975 nanometers or 1000 nanometers and it absorbs there and it emits in green or blue or something. So it is the other way around. So you can imagine the uh, frequency of the trapping is uh, wavelength is higher so the frequency is lesser. So you are starting from a, high, a low frequency and going to a higher frequency. There is a company, the mechanism you can ask him. So you can do it. And so first thing is uh, gold nanoparticles. So these gold nanoparticles you can see you can, this is a, a DIC image of 30 nanometer gold nanoparticle trapped here. This is from the work of Lene Odershede at uh, Denmark. So she has been trapping these gold nanoparticles for a, for a long time and uh, this is under the diffraction limit of light. So you cannot just easily visualize it. So she has to use differential interference contrast images to find this out. And beyond a certain point like when you go under 10 nanometers or something of the particle diameter, you cannot just visualize it. So what you rely on in the trap, you will see this quantized jumps. So the particle just comes in and you will see a scatter, an increased scatter in the reflection in the back scatter direction and uh, reduced scatter in the forward scatter direction. And from there you can infer that the particle has been trapped. So this is one particle, this is second particle, this is the third particle. And so this is I think 20 nanometers just under that. And you, it tells you here is the uh, curve between the radius of this particle. So this is 100 nanometers, this is 10 nanometers. You can see just under that it is like 8 nanometers or something that was the record so far. So these are the gold nanoparticles and uh, the uh, as a function of trap stiffness and you can see the trap stiffness also goes down as you use smaller and smaller particles. So what is happening out there is actually a combination of scattering force and uh, gradient force. So essentially there are two different forces working here. One is trying to push the particle out of the equilibrium in the uh, lateral direction and the other is the confinement uh, force. So uh, when the, you, you make it smaller and smaller, the confinement force becomes weaker compared to the scattering force. So you cannot trap under this point and it starts to push out of the trap. 
So that's the kind of competition between these two forces that we are looking at. So that's the kind of challenge we have to actually improve this. One of the ideas possibly is to use quantum systems where you can use the quantum levels to in, uh, increase this relative uh, trap stiffness of the uh, confinement over the other uh, scattering force and you can trap hopefully even smaller particles. These are gold nano rods. These are of the size of, uh, well, here it says 15 nanometers to 50 nanometers, 50 nanometers thick, uh, long is like 50 nanometers. And you can trap this thing, as I said, this is going to be, this power spectrum is going to look like that. It's called a Lorenzian. And so you will see this is one direction of this Lorenzian, this is the other direction. And it, because you have this kind of an asymmetry, so the two directions are looking different. So you can sort of get, uh, uh, you can illuminate it with a white light and you can get a spectrum out of it and you will see that you will, you will also simultaneously, uh, you are able to see plasma on resonances. There, there will be some resonances because if you, if the wavelength of the light matches with the size of the particle, you get a resonance. So that's called a plasma on resonance basically. So, and you can, uh, you can easily trap these particles and you can detect this plasma on resonances. You can play around with them for detection purposes, for sensor purposes. So that's the other thing. So you can use, uh, you can trap silicon nanowires. This is the work of Onofrio Marago at uh, Italy. So here he has this uh, twe tweezers. He has this uh, long uh, silver nanowires of the, well, these are one micron, two micron, three micron, and four micron long rods. And uh, well, this is the confinement volume. So as I said, you can find out the X, Y, and Z positions. And you can see that it is confined in these three dimensions. And this is how it looks like. The Z confinement is weaker than the X and Y confinement for uh, reasons because of the uh, tweezers itself. Because the tweezers uh, confinement, the Z confinement, as you should, is, uh, if you notice in one of the previous slides, the trap stiffness was weaker in the Z direction compared to X and Y direction. So this is why it's sort of uh, long in this sense and the uh, small in this uh, thickness. And this is how the uh, particle looks like being trapped. And this is the particle untrapped. So, and this is an optical trapping of graphene, graphene particles, graphene flakes. So you have the laser uh, turned off and it is freely floating around and then it's, it's turning on. So it, this is uh, looking, the contrast is better and it is at one spot and this again is flowing out. This is also the work of Onofrio Marago. And this is the tweezers here and you are using near infrared light to illuminate this uh, sample. So, and then quantum dots. So quantum dots are uh, things that sort of uh, have a quantum, a three-dimensional quantum level. Uh, you must have, if you studied quantum mechanics, you must have seen that uh, you have the uh, potential well, the famous potential well problem, finite potential well. Quantum dots is like that in three dimensions, it's just a finite potential well in a matrix basically. So you can have one quantum dot in a matrix. So the entire matrix can be of the size of, uh, well, these are the sizes. So these are like 10 nanometers. This is 15 and so on and so forth. This is the uh, diameter of this matrix. And there's one quantum dot in the middle somewhere. And you can sort of illuminate it and you can trap it. This is a, actually a, a rod kind of shaped in this particular case, but you can also do uh, sp spherical particles. And you will see this, uh, if you change the polarization of the light, you will be able to sort of see that the, uh, a quantum dot is also emitted by the um, uh, absorbs at the same polarization and then the polarization of emission also changes. So you can change this uh, um, polarization of uh, trapping and then turn it around and you will see the emission also change, uh, changes uh, intensities which means it is also the pol it's polarized, the emission is polarized. So that's what it indicates the quantum dots. And then I'll come down to some applications. So these applications actually, uh, well, there can be a lot of applications uh, for this. It is useful for physics, chemistry, biology. You can, so uh, the, obviously the Nobel Prize was announced for biology uh, applications, but you can also use it for physics and chemistry. So physics applications, there is a whole uh, lot of things coming up. Uh, well, I'll try to briefly touch upon that, but I think the main thing was in biology. So. I'll sort of um, focus more on biology aspects. This is the equilibrium and non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and then rheology. So we can do in vivo rheology. I'll, I'll come to that uh, in a moment. 
And then you have cell biology applications. You can have membrane fluctuations. You can have molecular biology applications. You can take, so what are these molecular biology applications? You can have single molecules, biomolecules like DNA, like uh, proteins. Uh, for example, there's something called molecular motors. As in these are kinesin, dynein, um, myosin, these are molecular motors. I'll come to that in a moment as well. So these kind of individual biomolecules you can address with optical tweezers and uh, you can basically apply forces and torques to them. So that's the sort of thing. And then I'll also briefly touch upon trapping in air, which is the physics aspect, which is coming in pretty rapidly these days. Uh, there was a uh, physical review just the other day having turned a nanoparticle of like 60 nanometers in size to a one gigahertz, 10 to the nine hertz. 10 to the 9 hertz, it's like neutron star rotating. So you can almost do that and it's almost to the break point of the material itself. It can, the material can simply break apart at that speeds. It's such fast. So here is uh, the first example. Let's, before, before you go into rheology, let's show, I'll show you uh, this RBC. Uh, this time it works. So this is an RBC which is uh, not, this is on the, along the side. So it is biconcave but it's along the side and has been held at two different spots. One uh, with a bead here and with another polystyrene bead here and it has been adhered to this surface of the RBC. And then you are applying a force. Red blood cells, erythrocytes, yes. So this is a biconcave shape and it has been folded on the axis, on the side axis. So. Uh, this is uh, the the tweezers is held at this point and at this point and you pull on this thing so you can see this held this strap is held at one spot but it still moves so you can see it stretches the rbc it's so elastic that you can actually stretch it and this way you can find out how healthy the cell is so you can find out whether the cell is healthy or it has malaria or it has some other disease, sickle cell anemia or something of this sort, and you can name it. So all kinds of things. You can uh, find out the elasticity of the membrane. You can find out uh, the deformability of this, of this thing as well. So you can sort of, uh, there are still research going on on this direction. A lot of research is happening. So this is just one of the ways of addressing RBCs. But the key idea here, please note that he is pulling this thing, this works, this is from the work of Pietro Sicuta at Cambridge. So he is pulling this uh, uh, tweezers and the membrane stretches, but there is a little bit of deformation even in this side. So the particle is, uh, uh, the bead on the other side is also getting pulled along on this side. So that sort of, uh, you can sort of find out what is the position here and what is the position here and based on the separation you can find out how it is responding. So the, what is the force and what is the extension basically, the extension to the RBC. So that gives you some kind of a response of the elasticity of the membrane basically. So that's the sort of thing. And then this is the other uh, application of uh, uh, tweezers. So here Pietro Sicuta again, here he actually addresses this problem directly of malaria. So what he does is he has a uh, few uh, RBCs here, erythrocytes as uh, in the technical name, erythrocytes. And he has some merozyte, which is the malaria pathogen, it generates a merozyte. So he takes this, he puts it in tweezers. I, the video was uh, much better, but it was too big. So I could not fit it in here. So I just put the snapshots of this thing. So you can find it out in Pietro Sicuta's website. So I just, uh, so here you can trap a particle, you can pull it along and you can put it on the side and it's, it's combined here and then you can see that the, part, uh, the erythrocyte deformed. So that is the onset of malaria. In malaria what happens? The erythrocytes get deformed. So this is what you will see. So that uh, sort of you can sort of, once you, once you have it, you can have these kinds of things and you can, well, you can study it better. You can sort of pull along and find out like what is the time scale in which it sort of resides on the interface and how so, so many other things. So now coming to rheology aspects. So what is rheology as in rheology is the uh, uh, study of the site, uh, some kind of a fluid basically. If you have some kind of a viscous medium. So what is the viscosity of the medium? That is studied by rheology. So you can have a viscoelastic medium, it studies the viscoelasticity of the membrane, uh, of the uh, mem uh, medium. 
So you can have a particle trapped in here and you can study the Brownian motion, that same Brownian motion that I just talked about. And uh, here you, you make the same mean square displacement plots. The plots differ from uh, the linear slope, the uh, t, uh, exponent equal to one slope. It just deviates from here and it becomes somewhat like this, this, something like this and so on and so forth. And the frequency plot instead of Lorentzian, it will give you something like this. So this can be used to study the viscoelasticity of the thing. So we have been doing some theoretical work as well together on these sides. And we have been trying to find out how the mean square displacement changes and how, what is uh, the, based on the exponent here or the slope here, what is the value of the viscoelasticity of the membrane? So how do you characterize that thing? We are doing some theory as well as on this. So next is, uh, in vivo rheology. So uh, basically some of the applications, uh, basically if you have an yeast cell, this is again done by Lene Odeshede. So she has uh, vesicles in here. She traps these vesicles and then she basically finds how the, in the presence of the trap, how the particle is moving around. How does it, like why do you need a trap for that? You can just sit and do a video kind of an imaging for that. So what is the advantage? So the advantage lies in the fact that you are using a tweezers beam, a light beam, that has, uh, it can have a higher temporal resolution. It can have a temporal resolution and a spatial resolution, which is much better than video imaging. Video imaging, you can, you are limited with normally the video cameras are like 30 milliseconds as in 30 frames per second. And or at best, if you want to go for really fancy cameras, you will get one millisecond cameras like 1000 frames per second. But beyond that, it becomes a challenge. So here, it is here that you, if you want to go into under that kind of uh, scales, like 100 microseconds or something, you will need to go for scattering techniques. So that is where you will uh, use uh, these optical tweezers and you will have a better temporal uh, resolution than this. So, and then this is another example again done by Lene Odeshede. So she has two vesicles here. Vesicles are like a lipid bilayer enclosing something. And so these vesicles you can take, you can put a, connect these two and put a gold nanoparticle here and bring it here. So what she does is she illuminates it with a tweezers laser beam and then it heats up. So as it heats up, it fuses these membranes. The, it just fuses the membranes up. So you can see this is, this became one. So this sort of bilayer, if you put it like this and then it heats up so much that it sort of melts this vesicle up, the lipid bilayer up and it becomes fuses into one. So that's the sort of thing that happened. And then, um, so this has, she has also extended it for live cells or, yeah, it's like yes, it's like welding. It's just melting this uh, middle portion, the vesicle portion and it just fuses into one. You have, she has used it for cells as well. So then I come to something that I have personally worked on. This is the kinesin, the molecular motors kinesin. So as I was telling you, these molecular motors are like proteins, which has uh, this kind of a structure. So the key aspect of this thing is it has two heads. These are called heads and these are called tails. These heads move on a microtubule lattice. The microtubule is a kind of a thread-like kind of a thing, which has tubulin dimers uh, next to each other. So it, it has the spacing is eight nanometers. So the feet are such that it likes to attach to one side of the tubulin lattice so that the steps are also 8 nanometers. So you will, if you take the resolve the steps, you will find 8 nanometer steps. So microtubules are important. I mean, these kinesins are important because you can actually address, directly address the diseases using this. So you can sort of uh, say that uh, my kinesin basically has two main uh, purposes. One is that it carries cargo inside your cells. For example, if you take the nerve cell, why does Alzheimer's disease happen or for that matter um, Parkinson's disease happen? So it actually, there is a way in which the food or the uh, particles are transferred through this neurons and that is mediated by kinesin. So if you somehow block these pathways, if the kinesin cannot move, then you have the diseases happening. So that's the one thing. The other thing is that this kinesin also carries cargo inside a, a other cell. And it also uses, it's also useful for cell division. So it has these two feet and the uh, two heads and the two tails. And if you have two microtubules next to each other, it just walks from one side to the other and it pushes, pushes these microtubules apart. So it pushes this apart. Therefore, this is how the cell division happens. 
So what is cancer? Cancer is nothing but an uncontrolled cell division. So it is just moving the cells, dividing the cells more and more, uncontrolled division of cells is cancer, it's malignant cancer. So if you can arrest this kinesin network and not allow it to move the cells apart, you're arresting cancer. So this is one of the uh, ways, this is actually kinesin 5 that arrests this, uh, is useful for cancer treatment. And so this is, uh, this thing has been studied optical, uh, with optical tweezers very extensively. So people have found out what sort of drugs you can give to this thing, um, kinesin 5, and it will uh, arrest cancer. There is kind of a combination therapy and all these kinds of things that are useful for this. So I personally uh, came in here and we used uh, these particles. These are attached with kinesin. These are the birefringin particles that I just talked about. And you attached with kinesin. And these are actually moving on a microtubule lattice. These microtubules happen to be uh, very thin. These are like uh, 30 nanometers in wide. And the reason you are not seeing it here because uh, we have taken out the DIC sliders, the differential interference contrast sliders by which you can see these things. So because the reason why we did that was that we wanted to also see how it twists, how the thing kinesin twists as it moves in the translation fashion. So if you use the DIC sliders, it actually messes the polarization up, so you cannot see it rotate very well. So that, that's why we moved it. But you can see the general features. It sort of starts here, and you can see it is moving here, moving here, and then it also uh, becomes dark. So what does dark mean here? The dark actually means that it is actually turning. So it goes from a 45 degree orientation to a, uh, a zero orientation. So it is turning by 45 degrees by that. Now there is a kind of a calculation like, um, because there is a finite drag on the system, you cannot quite get a full 180 degree rotation per step because kinesin you would assume it to be rotating like this and then the next step would be like this. But we find out that it's actually like this and then the other feet goes around this thing and it twists, it turns on, wind, winds up like this. So that's the sort of uh, thing that we were after and we saw this thing here. So we saw this kinesin twisting and uh, we could not see the full steps. We resolved the full steps because it's big. The cargo is uh, of the order of one micrometer and if you can consider the rotational drag on the system, it is not able to twist the full 180 degrees in that one time step, which is like one millisecond. So you cannot see one uh, full rotation, you will see partial rotations instead. So. Uh, so here we have done something else. We have taken this thing in a static trap. The kinesin is held. It does not, here it is bright. And then it is sort of moving towards the one step and uh, moving towards one side. And it will be slightly uh, deformed. The thing is sort of uh, dark, darker here. And uh, you also simultaneously see that it is stalled. So the reason it is stalled is it's in tweezers. So it is holding this uh, particle from going beyond a certain region. It is applying a force. So that force is like five nanonewt piconewtons of force, five piconewtons of force, five to six piconewtons of force basically, is a stall force on the system. And it holds the particle here and it doesn't allow it to go beyond that. So this is in a static trap. And uh, once it happens, it, uh, the load on the feet are so much that it actually detaches from the microtubule and it goes back to the equilibrium point. So that's what is happening here. Now, if you have, there's something called a force clamp as well. It's also a variant of optical tweezers. Nobody in India has so far the optical uh, force clamp configuration because it's pretty hard to implement. But uh, the idea is that as you move this particle, the trap follows this thing. So you are applying a constant load. You are, since it's k times x, so if you fix the displacement, uh, the x displacement, uh, the trap center behind the uh, position of the particle, you can find out, you can apply a constant force on this thing. So that's called the force clamp. So that sort of happens here. So it is sort of moving here like this and the force clamp, the uh, tweezers follows this thing. And here, even then you are seeing this uh, slight weakening, the uh, less bright, this is a sli slightly less bright configuration than this. So that's sort of happening here as well. So in, in, in all cases, it's sort of indicating that there is a kind of a rotation as well together with translation and you can resolve these things with uh, optical tweezers. So in the next slide, I'll show you some results of this measurement. So here, it is in the static trap as I was telling you. And this, uh, as, it, as the load becomes larger and larger, uh, it sort of, you can see there are some steps here. Some steps appear. So what are these steps? Basically, these are the same steps that the kinesin is moving with. So it's, it's eight nanometers. If you look at the sides, it's eight nanometer steps. 
and it stalls at this point and beyond which it cannot move uh, uh, because the load becomes so large it has to go back to the equilibrium point and we are simultaneously seeing something which are these rotational uh, steps as well rotational steps as i said it cannot do a full 180 degree rotation because of drag but it does partial rotations so it is enough to do 1.1 degrees here which is the average uh, step size here but at this point it will stall and it is sort of confined by the tweezers again the tweezers also acts in the rotational sense as well so both of these things simultaneously you're doing so this is correlated with these things and this translation and rotation are correlated and you can sort of see this and the torque uh, you can apply at this point like 1000 piconewton nanometers of torque so the same thing this is at high atp concentrations atp is nothing but the unit of energy for a for a uh, molecular motor the atp if you take one atp the uh, uh, motor converts one atp into motion basically so per step it takes one atp so if you 200 micromolars is high atp concentrations beyond 50 micromolars it's high atp concentrations already up to one millimolar and uh, there you can see these steps nicely at 50 micromolars also you can see these steps but under a certain atp concentration it becomes flat so it does not uh, twist anymore so that's the sort of thing we have this is a force lamp actually so it is sort of you can still see steps in here but you cannot resolve it because uh, well uh, it's too slow for this thing so it, it is also it, it runs into technical problems but otherwise this is a force lamp and this rotational signal is completely flat on this hand you have see at high atp concentrations this is the kind of uh, translational steps and these are the rotational signals here it goes almost till 45 degrees you can see this is uncorrelated this looks completely different so these are uncorrelated at 45 degrees it turns and uh, stalls here and it goes beyond that and all, all kinds of things and the rotational signal cannot increase beyond 45 degree mark so this is a uh, force clamp operation so you can see that this is sort of twisting together with this so that's how we sort of figured that uh, the kinesin molecule was uh, more efficient than 50 percent because we figured that uh, it was initially believed that 40 piconewton nanometers of energy is used per step and uh, given by 100 piconewton nanometer of uh, energy that the atp can provide one single atp molecule can provide the rest of the energy basically is used for rotation it is not used for translation it is used for rotation so that's the sort of uh, conclusion from here and then this was all in vit uh, in v uh, vitro that is outside the cell now i go inside a cell you can see that there is a lot of activity we have this is from rupalek uh, at tifr he has done this work so he, he, there are some, these polystyrene particles which he has put inside dictyostelium cell and sort of it is sort of moving all over the place and these particles actually have two different kinds of molecular motors attached to it these are the kinesin and the dynein so kinesin moves in one direction the dynein moves in the other direction so this sort of uh, competition between this dynein and kinesin is the basis for cargo transport inside a cell so if if you arrest any of this motion it the cell will go completely haywire so, so you, these kinds of things we have also seen in, in our cells but my, my videos are slightly longer so I, th uh, so I thought i'll just use this one so you can actually trap one of these uh, things and you can show how the uh, uh, motility takes place how the uh, particle is moving inside the trap and you can find out how much at how much loads it is stalling and all these kinds of things so you can affect a uh, tug of war is just like the uh, competition between the kinesin and the dynein and you can bias it on one side so that's the kind of thing and then this is kind of a this tug of war competition optical trapping in vivo you can see that this is uh, trying to move and it's getting stalled here and it's coming back and then again it does that so these are two different events of this sort and then two different events on the other side so in one side you have kinesin and the other side you have dynein dynein is another molecular motor as i just said and so it is going in the reverse direction and these are some displacements you don't need to know the technical details of this thing so then you can use it for single molecule conformational changes as in um, so uh, this is dna or proteins uh, rna or something these have these are like so what is what are these things these are nothing but a long chain of uh, amino acids so it has it has a double stranded kind of a structure and it can sort of uh, there are so if it folds up 
if it folds in a certain way, it manifests itself as something else. If it folds up in a different way, it manifests itself in a completely different way. So how it can fold up and it can unfold it has a lot of information and what kind of function it can have. It's called the structure function relation between the structure of this DNA and the functionality of the DNA. If you want to address diseases, you have to go down to the structure of this DNA itself. So uh, you can apply the controlled forces, and you can put two beads on the two sides of this uh, uh, DNA molecules and you can pull on them and you can sort of uh, see how it unfolds and see which of the configurations are energetically favorable, which of them are uh, not energetically favorable and study these conformations. So you can sort of have uh, a typical thing that you can do is you can attach one of these beads to a micro pipette and then you have the uh, uh, amino acid or the protein here or the DNA here and you can have an optical tweezers here and you can pull on this uh, pipette, micro pipette here on this side as I was telling you for the RBC the same, thing, same sort of thing happens here and this uh, will deform this uh, push this particle here so difference between them is going to give you the elongation that the uh, DNA saw and based on how much load you put, you can find out the relation between the load and the uh, extension, the force extension curve. So this is the force, this is the extension and you can see there is a kind of a hysteresis here. So it is sort of going from one trajectory and going to the other trajectory suddenly and going out. So here you will have jumps, sudden jumps here. So these jumps indicates the structural changes. So one of these trajectories is one of the energetically, uh, one of the energetic configurations of this. It can be described by the worm-like chain model if you want to know precisely. In polymer physics, it's called a worm-like chain model. And uh, in the other configuration, it's a different energetic configuration and this is jumping from one to the other. If you fold and unfold, it has two different kind of trajectories involved. So these are the kinds of, if you, if you unwind these events, you will get these kinds of trajectories and these uh, indicate the different energy levels or the energetic configurations of this uh, DNA. So these are the different potential wells if you want the, uh, that the uh, DNA sees or the protein sees. So if you start from here, it goes from one, jumps to the other, the, then it goes to the other one. So you, you can have four or five different, as many as them, as many are there. So there are, this is for a heat shock protein uh, that has been done at TU Munich by Matthias Reif. And he has been seeing these things for like a long time. So you, you can study this con con confor conformational states of this DNA. So the next thing that I have is, uh, how much time, time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. This is the uh, polymerase transcription. So what what here? This is the work done by Stephen Block. So you have two different beads here, and you have this kind of a complicated thing. So what it does, I'll tell you this in simple terms. It forms a protein. It makes a protein. So. It is making a protein and the thing is getting longer and longer because it, uh, as you pull on this thing, uh, so it's getting longer and longer, you can see like this. And you are actually now applying a force. On, you're pulling with the tweezers and you're uh, applying a force here. So as you pull along, you can see the effect of force on this elongation. So how this force is influencing the system. So you can see that there are certain jumps here. So in one of these conformations, it suddenly, uh, uh, was feeling less drag on this thing or less uh, uh, retarding force. So it just uh, jumped like this and so on. So you can give all kinds of analysis to it. But the key idea is that in transcription particularly, you can actually, even while the DNA is forming, you can sort of um, apply a force and accentuate the effect, so amplify the effect basically. So, and then I'll go to slightly different topic. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of my last slides. Uh, I have just one or two slides after this. But uh, I wanted to talk about, this is something I had to talk about because this is the, uh, the direction in which the field is going. So it is actually trapping in air. So, so far we had been doing in water medium only because live molecules and cells, uh, the bio, bio molecules are in water. So uh, if you put it in air, it will probably just be dead. So. Uh, here you take this, uh, in, but in air also you, you can go into another domain, you can go into quantum domains as I was telling you the physics applications of this for, uh, tweezers. So there Arthur Ashkin also started the work, this is in 1971 where he had this uh, 
beam, one beam from here and the other beam from here and he sort of manages to find an equilibrium spot. As I was telling you here, uh, at that time he did not know that it can trap in three dimensions, so it can only confine in two dimensions that he thought. So he had one trap doing this two dimensions and the other trap doing this third dimension and this is how you, he stabilized this particle here in air. So he, he has a picture here of a 20 micrometer transparent glass particle sitting in free space uh, in air actually and uh, it's above the glass slide and this is done by the optical tweezers so this is optical levitation by radiation pressure and uh, then i go into some well this is a i sort of conclude by showing my setup here in iit madras so this is the tweezers here this is a, there's a kind of a objective here that it focuses the light down to a tight spot as i was telling you it's a gaussian beam so it focuses into a tight spot in the middle and then it comes out and we collect the light here and we send it into the detectors, detectors here. We have a laser, this is a laser and this is the path that it takes. So that's sort of it, thank you.